Hey, welcome my beautiful friends to the Teresa Lusk show where faith and freedom meet and your voice is heard. Today we have one of the most outstanding Latino voices that you are going to meet. We have the amazing Rich Valdez. And Rich is a, a radio show host in the evening. And I want to talk to you about his about Rich a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, his show is Rich Valdez America at Night, and he brings forth late night radio alive with the perfect blend of news, entertainment, interesting interviews, pop culture, and insight. He has been named on the heavy hundred list of the 100 most important radio talk show hosts in America by Talkers Magazine. And of course, my favorite, the Hispanic Radio Host of the Year by Metropolitan Magazine of New York. Rich, welcome to the Teresa Lusk Show. Teresa Lusk, what an honor. Thank you for having me. Hey, you know, I am so excited to have you. I've been wanting to have you on my show for a while. I actually have had the privilege and honor to be on your radio show before. And I thought this is a man who really needs to be heard throughout. And I know you already are because you've got this amazing radio show. But the reason why I think your voice is so important in this season, Rich, is because you're a Latino, but you're American. And you're also a conservative. Tell us a little bit. I asked you a little while ago, have you yeah. always been a conservative or were you a Democrat? I just assumed because you're a Latino, you were a, probably a Democrat right. before. Tell us the story behind that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It is a funny story. So, you know, I'm, I'm 46 now. And uh, so I've been at this stuff for, for probably about 20 years on the political side. And I was in business before that. But what, what, what happened for me, right, the awakening for me was, I started in business really, really young. Uh, at 16, I started a business, a barbershop. I was messing around, cutting hair for my friends and drawing designs in the side of their head. And my brother said, you know, you can actually turn it into a real business. So I said, wow, I could do a real business. I didn't think of that. And honestly, I didn't have the confidence in myself that I have today. And I said to him, I think you're going to waste your money. I think we're going to lose on this. You know, I'm, I'm 16, right? Uh, the most important thing for me is, you know, getting that girl's number and, and laughing with my friends. But <laughs> He didn't. Uh, he didn't sell me short, and and the business grew, and I did well, and I did it for a number of years. I went to cosmetology school, and having a business really young, you start to learn very quickly that uh, in a state like New Jersey, where I was born in Brooklyn, but I moved to New Jersey when I was twelve, and uh, in Hudson County, New Jersey, it, it's a great neighborhood, great people, but it's still a very blue government. And when you start making some money as a young person, they start taking it. The more you make, the more they take. So by the time I was like 18, 19 years old, I wanted to have a brand new car. Honestly, I was a little greedy. I wanted two brand new cars. And, and I realized, <laughs> wow, th this is horrible, the amount of money that I have to pay to the government when they didn't do anything to earn what I'm mm. earning. And, and I didn't like it. So that was around the time, 1999, 2000, of, of uh, Al Gore running for president. And like conventional wisdom, I thought Al Gore was vice president for eight years to, at the time, the media told me uh, Bill Clinton was the best president ever. And 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 part of me was like, all right, so he did a few uh, indiscretions in the White House. Who knows, right? <laughs> Who wouldn't do that, right? A lot of people wrote that off. So I thought to myself, I mean, it probably was a little uncouth. You don't really do that in the White House. But again, I was 18. It's going to be my first vote uh, for president. So I thought Al Gore had to be the guy. And, uh, and I didn't know much about Governor Bush. But I started to see how that panned out and I'm watching the debates and really it gets down to Florida and how Gore handles himself. He's coming out to concede. And all of a sudden, uh, his chief of staff, who interestingly was chief of staff to Joe Biden just recently as well, oh. tells him, hey, don't concede. And he mm -hmm. turns around, he does the about face and he goes back in. And it's interesting how I, and I thought, wow, that was odd uh, because, you know, you, he lost fair and square. But then starts the whole election denying. And that was really where I lost a ton of respect for Al Gore. And I thought, you know what? If this is what Democrats do, if this is what Al Gore is all about, and he's going to sit there and whine and cry, uh, and, cry and, and moan about what's going on with the election, um, to me, I'm going with the other guy, right? Because the other guy seemed to make more sense. And on issues of faith, we agreed, George Bush and I. So um, I gave Bush a chance. And, and again, I was never committed to any party. That was my first time voting in, in a uh, presidential race. Uh, I liked what Bush did. I liked the way that, uh, it, you know, for the most part, it made sense. My businesses did well. I had gotten out of the barbershop business and then gotten into the cell phone business. And again, I'm now I'm in my early 20s. And I thought, this is cool. And I met more people in business. You know, you, you tend to get invited to different things, chambers of commerce, this, that, and the other. And I started to meet a lot of people, both sides of the aisle. 
And everybody tries to recruit you. They're like, oh, you're young, you're interesting, you're somewhat articulate, why don't you come with us? And I was like, I don't know, if, I just wanna sell cell phones and cut hair and do what I was doing. And the uh, eventually I met a guy who was uh, chairman of the Republican party in, in uh, Hudson County, New Jersey, good guy. And he invited me to uh, New Hampshire to do some uh, volunteer work on the Bush campaign. And I thought, cool, let's go, it sounds like a good time. I had a great time with a bunch of interesting Republicans from all over the country who were volunteering on the campaign. I met some great people in New Hampshire. And honestly, after that, it was kind of, my mind was made up. I realized, you know, on matters of faith, I knew where I stood. On matters uh, of taxes and, and spending, I knew where I stood. And, and Republicans, for the most part, were in line with that. They were big spenders, but not as big of a spender or tax and spend liberal like a Democrat. So to me, it made all the sense in the world. And there was one thing from my youth that always stuck in my mind, and it was this. They always said, you know, uh, Republicans are for the rich, Democrats are for the poor. And my mom, who was born in Santurce, Puerto Rico, my dad is born in Caguas, Puerto Rico. Um, they, they, um, they didn't really care much for politics, but my mother loved Reagan. And when Reagan spoke on the television, it was like, no, 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 callate, callate, because right now the president <laughs> is speaking, right? So we had to listen to Ronald Reagan. And, and I remember always hearing Democrats are for the poor, Republicans are for the rich. I grew up very poor. And all I thought to myself was, I've done the poor thing already. I don't need Democrats to help me be poor. I want to be rich. So I'm going with the Republicans. <laughs> I love it. That's how it made sense for me. And, and honestly, I've never really turned back. I wouldn't really uh, consider myself a Republican per se. Uh, I, I am a registered Republican, but really it's about conservative values and doing the right thing. If tomorrow the, the pro-life party, the, the, uh, the, the yeah. liberty party became the Democrats, I'd be a Democrat tomorrow because it's about those values for me. Sure. Wow. That's a phenomenal story. So one of the things about you is that you have just this great diverse background. Now you've been in media, you you're on, you're a commentator. Is that correct for Newsmax at this point? Yeah, I do a uh, weekly commentary on Newsmax. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what happened because I want to kind of tie in what's happening right now is we're seeing this amazing increase of Latinos all of a sudden in your area, by the way, we're talking about the Bronx, we're talking about all this area, right? Which I was like, yes, they're waking up, they're waking up, you know, but I was thinking about it this morning as I was preparing for our interview and thinking what happened that made people, first of all, fall in love with Obama, that the Latinos and, and a lot of black people, they were so anti-Republican, right? It was the racism party, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think happened between what happened with Obama and then where we are today and what is really going on with our Latino community? Well, I think one thing, one, one thing, uh, maybe two. The, the one thing that happened is Donald Trump being a master marketer and saying fake news. This was a game changer, right? Because before that, we didn't realize how big the entertainment uh, establishment was and how entertainment works hand in hand with media. And uh, oftentimes we hear the same thing over and over. Uh, I remember my brother coming to me uh, back in the um, 2004 election, telling me, you're gonna go work with for George W. Bush? You know, this guy dragged a black man on the back of his pickup truck through Texas? And I was like, what? I never heard about that. <laughs> and it didn't happen, right? It was, it was a case where he had, a, there was a, a request for a pardon and there were some comments made of somebody else that dragged somebody. But again, the way the telephone game works, people go, no, it was Governor Bush who did that, right? And, and things get taken out of context so quickly and so uh, rapidly. So I, I realized that then, and I've known that the media is, is nothing more than, than a PR machine for whoever's in power. Yes. And, and that's just how it works. So, the, you know, there was talk radio. I'd listen to talk radio. I'd listen to lots of things. I read a lot. And, and I, I was a part of real life, right? I, I'm, not a, um, I'm not by any means a home body. I, I, I spend very little time at home. I don't like being at home. I go to bars. I go to restaurants. I go to church. I go to parties. I go, you name it, I go. I'm always mingling and I'm always talking to people, getting a piece of their mind because I love to know where yeah, they're at. It's good. And with, with that being said, what I experienced in life and what I was hearing in the media were always so different. But that's just mm -hmm. how life worked, right? We were told you, you have to like uh, this movie. You have to like that actor and this actress yes. and this music. And this big star comes out with a new song and it's number one on the billboard chart. And everything is kind of almost scripted to a, a degree. And I get it. That's the PR machine. That's how it works right. in Hollywood. But I understood that and I accepted that. I don't think everybody understood that. And I think people really thought things were organic and that mm -hmm. these things were not pushed by large corporations that, you know, like Viacom, for example. Viacom owned MTV. They owned ABC News. They, it, they could get 
Good Morning America to say nice things about what was going on on MTV. It, it was just a, and at the time they also owned, um, I forget the name of the big company, but it was an outdoor media company. I think it was called CBS Outdoor. And, uh, and they had billboards everywhere. So you could have billboards and they owned radio stations, hundreds of them. So it, it was a complete full circle thing. You know, the, listen to this person on this radio station, listen to these songs on this mm -hmm. radio station, do this. Mm -hmm. You see them on, at, wherever you go, you see them. And there's this push for these products and this way of life, et cetera. So I understood how it worked and it was what it was. Trump comes in, you know, fast forward a million years uh, into 2016, 2015, and he says, fake news, you're fake news. Uh, and people, oh my gosh, how could you say the media is fake? How dare you? Como te atreve? Right? But yeah. it becomes this big, big thing. And it makes all the sense in the world to me because those two words cut through the noise. They cut through mm -hmm. the noise for people to go, the news might be lying. Wow. Mm -hmm. Who thought that the news could be lying? And that when I go to abcnews.com or nbcnews.com, that that could be a biased look. Now, there were a lot right. of things that added to that, right? Dan Rather, huge newsman, he lied about Bush and got caught. Yeah. Uh, on this uh, whole 60 Minutes thing. So that was another big thing, again, that happened back, I guess it was 2003-ish, I'm thinking. So as these things start to stack on one another, I'm seeing them unfold. I'm like, oh, wow. So it's these incremental uh, changes and I think offenses against the media, against the establishment, against uh, entertainment, uh, and how you they're all kind of together in many ways, where I started to realize, well, that's not a thing. And I think more and more people started to realize it too. And comes Trump and says, you're fake news. People go, yeah, you're right. Then following that COVID COVID comes and people get locked out of their homes. They're locked out of their churches. Yeah. They become prisoners in their own homes. You're killing grandma. If you don't wear a mask, all sorts of things happen. <laughs> and, and everybody wants to do the right thing, right? Nobody wants to say, I want to kill Abuela. I, nobody wants to kill their Abuela or yours. Everybody's like, Oh, I'm going <laughs> to do the right thing. I got to, I have to do what's right. But again, life, God, however you want to phrase it, I get the opportunity to work at, uh, I'm, I'm in radio by that time. I work at WABC radio in New York city. And I'm the only guy coming into work. I was taking a bus from New Jersey into the city and then walking through the city or taking a subway. And there's nobody on the subways except the people that live mm -hmm. there. there. There's nobody on the streets except for a handful of homeless and barely uh, rats and some cops. And, and, and the city's <laughs> in a complete standstill. Yeah, there were rats everywhere because they had nothing to eat. Normally, they would oh live underground and then they come up at night, eat the garbage and they go back. Oh but because there was no garbage because the restaurants were closed, the rats were all topside on the sidewalk everywhere. It looked like the bubonic plague. There was not a lot of media about that, but it was astonishing to see mm. the amount of rats just running across 8th Avenue. There were no taxis, there were no trucks. There was nothing but rats. And it, it, the whole thing was surreal. And I went to work every single day. And then the radio station was sold and some policies were changed. And they said, hey, look, you have to, um, you have to get a vaccine to work here. And I said, you know, it's funny. Oh, I, I, I've worked here when nobody else was working here during the middle of this pandemic. And now that it's subsiding, you have these new rules, which I think are stupid. So I, I, I'm gonna leave. And ultimately um, things worked out. I, I took a job with a different company. Uh, things worked in way better for me. And uh, and here I am today. But it, it, it's that's my own side of the story. The, the, the bigger part of it to answer your question is I think people started to see, wow, the media lied. And they're seeing more and more of it now, even just the last two days with uh, Fauci's testimony uh, right. Saying uh, yes. it was arbitrary, the six foot thing. Um, well, we yeah. didn't do the, you know, the, these repeated lies about gain of function and all these things. So I think people start mm -hmm. to see that and they go, you know what? I gave you the benefit of the doubt. I trusted the right. science. I gave yeah. you 15 days to flatten the curve. Uh, you said Trump was a Russian agent. I believed you and I hated him and he was orange and he was bad. But <laughs> guess what? Yeah. Guess what? Now everybody mm -hmm. and their mother can see that Donald Trump is literally a political yeah. prisoner and that they're going right. after him. You've got big Democrat donors. I, ju I just saw one $300,000 he donated to Trump. Uh, this is a Clinton donor. And he's because yeah. he felt like he got duped. I remember that. Right. Mm -hmm. So people are getting duped and they're saying, you know what? They're coming after Trump way harder than anything we've ever seen. Sure. 91 felony counts, four different mm -hmm. indictments. Uh, two phony impeachments, one of which he wasn't even president and they impeached him. So when you look at all that stuff happening, you realize, man, this is not good. And people, I think, uh, not only Hispanics, everyone is looking at this right. saying, wow, we've been right. sold a bill of goods that's fake, it's phony, and it's fraud. And that's mm -hmm. what you see happening with Latinos when they say, you yes. know what, life was better with Trump. And I think for yeah. the most part, across the board, people are saying the same thing.
Absolutely, because I think, um, and, and I'm, this is certainly not just applicable to the Latino community, but I speak of it because certainly in my area, if you're Hispanic, Latino, they expect you to vote Democrat. And I saw how much brainwashing was going on. I am seeing the, the waking up of our community where they are starting to go, well, maybe he wasn't as racist as I thought he was. And you know what? You know what it took to be hit in the pocketbook. Yeah. Like they had to get hit in the pocketbook to actually go, maybe this is something that's not. And I saw the support of the people in the Bronx, the major support that he got. And so what are some things that you can uh, leave with our viewers and just kind of give them some advice on how do we move forward so that this doesn't happen again? Because the media is so volatile. I was at a, a school of campaign for women this past weekend. And listen, there was a whole lot of uh, Democrat liberal people. I was the minority. Probably I was the most far, far right person. But I'm going to tell you this. We were able to have great conversations and we were able to reach across the aisle and talk about our different policies. Why do we see things the way we do? Why do we vote the way we do? It was no longer about bigot and progressive. It was literally just I'm a human being and these these are my convictions and this is what I'm going to fight for and stand for. It was the most beautiful thing. And I started to really hone in a lot more on how volatile the media is on purpose. And you made a comment about that earlier. What are some things that viewers can be so aware of from this point forward? Because I don't know about you, Rich. I think you and I are very uh, hyper vigilant, right? If you tell me something on the media, I'm going to research it in several several you know, avenues, not yeah. just one way. So what do you say to that? Well, I think overall in life, I guess uh, me, I've always been a very uh, inquisitive kind of little kid and I grew up to be an inquisitive adult, right? So it makes sense that I have this interview show where I get to interview people and it, it works great for me. But I think you can't just, you know, if you tell me something, I'm like, oh, well, Teresa said, no, I, I think everybody, whether it's the media, whether it's Joe Biden, whether it's Donald Trump, you have to know stuff. The issue that we face in life is that our economy has changed so much over the years where people have to work so much harder than they really ever did, right? I think people used to go on two vacations a year. Now they're down to one vacation a year. Some people watching this might go, I don't even go on vacation anymore. I go every three or four years. So I, I think th this is part of the issue we have where we're spending so much of our time working that we're not enjoying our lives. But when you have time, you, you need to try to be able to decipher the truth. Whether you're in church, you visit a church and you hear some scripture or, or an interpretation of scripture that you may not know or have heard, and you go, man, that doesn't sound right. Or maybe you go, wow, that sounds phenomenal. I never heard that before. Maybe you should find out if that's accurate, <laughs> right? Go and check the same way. You, the, the way the media fact checks everything, we need to fact check the things that we hear and not by going to the fact checkers because last I checked to be in the media as a reporter, as a journalist, that is your job to fact check. You know, I spent uh, about a year writing a column for the Washington Times. And I had to have three sources th that I submitted to the editor and and th they couldn't be three anonymous sources, uh, even if it was an opinion article. If I say if I cited a fact, they had to be a fact that I could prove and say I got it here, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, we, they, they played fast and loose with the standards in the media. And I think people, again, they just don't care. They're like, I, I got to feed my kid. I got to pay child support. I got to pay rent. I've got to pay my car note. I've got to pay whatever. I've gotta, I got to figure out how I'm going to get my own apartment because right now I'm sleeping on my friend's couch. Whatever people's situation is, the last thing they want to do is figure out if the news is lying to them or if Biden's telling a half truth. But A, that's part of why I think you and me and others that do this type of work we do, giving commentary on the news is important. But B, it's important for all of us. You can't go to the car dealership and think that the car dealer is telling you, listen, it's going to be a great deal. Trust me, you're going to love it. No, I don't trust you. Maybe I love it, but I don't trust you. I want to make yeah. sure it's in writing. I want to make sure this is the truth. I want to make sure that interest rates not going to change six months, a year, three years down the road, or that there's not some big balloon payment at the end. And, and I think that's the same way we have to conduct ourselves with everything else and not believe everything we're told. Ultimately, I think there's also a lack of civic education uh, overall. I didn't know I had this lack of education. It just dawned on me. I happened to meet a, a, a guy uh, named Rick Green many years ago, and he was partnered up with David Barton. Barton had written this amazing book called Original Intent. I got the book. It was about the Constitution, about the original intent of the Constitution, how times have changed and words have changed, meanings have changed, but the original intent of the Constitution was never really intended to change. And that uh, opened doors for me to start listening to... Um, uh, Mark Levin on the radio. I became a big fan of Mark Levin, uh, former chief of staff in the Reagan White House at the Department of Justice. And he uh, had a radio show on the weekends in New York that I used to listen to. 
And then I eventually started working with Mark Levin as his producer, as a associate producer. Mr. Call Screener was my nickname on the show. Awesome. And, and that's kind of how I got into radio. I had never worked in radio mm -hmm. until I worked with Mark. And, and I learned so much about the Constitution, about historical analysis using the context of history. You know, if, if I tell you that Julius Caesar did X, Y, and Z, but I don't know what the, the norms were back in the time of Julius Caesar, I'm losing a lot of context. The same way if we look at the Constitution and we don't know who informed the, the, the founders when they were uh, drafting this document, uh, it's important to know that most of these guys were informed and inspired by uh, thinkers from the Enlightenment. And if we, you know, if we study right. the Enlightenment, then we know, wow, we know exactly where they were, where their head was at. So when you read this, you know, it comes from that context. There's also the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. And I think understanding our history, understanding the, the people that informed the founders and where their head was at, Alexei de Tocqueville uh, and, and others that were putting big works of writing together at the time on, on the idea of the Republic, the idea of democracy mm -hmm. uh, and understanding this is what America is strengthens you as an individual to now say, when I hear Joe Biden say that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy, by what standard and for what purpose right. is he making this statement? Does it benefit me as part of the, the body politic? I don't think so. I think this right. benefits him in a political uh, perspective. So once you can look at those things critically, I, I think we become a more informed population of people. And ultimately, being informed as patriots is what Reagan called us to do, right? To be informed patriots. And I think that's key. Not easy. It requires reading. It requires right. studying. It requires a lot. But yes. it's the only way you're not going to get ripped off ideologically. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. I think that's really good um, advice. But also, I think what is interesting is a lot of people, Rich, they'll say, I'm not political, but yet they they take in and, and take in and then regurgitate everything that they hear from their one favorite media platform or yeah. their favorite politician, et cetera. So they are political. Can we be honest? They oh, are political. 100 percent. Well, here's part that, that happens for two reasons. One is because people are uh, adverse to getting involved in things that they think are going to be contentious, right? So people say that they're not political because they don't want to engage. They want to seem like they're in the middle, on the sideline. I'm not involved with Crook A or Crook B or the Red Gang or the Blue Gang. They're all the bunch of crooks to me, right? That people feel comfort in this being non-committal. Uh, imagine saying, look, I'm not married to my girlfriend or, or to my wife, right? Uh, you can't really do that. It just isn't the right. You have to take a position. You have to say, no, this is my wife and that's who I'm with. Or no, I'm not married. This is my girlfriend. Right. You, you can't live your life in the middle. The other part of that is we've been told to never talk about politics and religion. But you look at the history of this country and how we started. All we talked about was politics and religion. And people were very well versed on these topics. So that's as right. we go about history, we start realizing pay attention to the blood sport, right? Like they did back in Rome, um, you know, when they put the lions in there with people and, and whatever was happening in the amphitheater, uh, focus on entertainment, don't focus on what matters so that Rome can do what Rome is doing. We do the same thing here. Look at the NFL, look at Major League Baseball, look at UFC, look at whatever you want, NASCAR, but don't look at what the politicians are doing and how they're spending your money or how we're not sticking to what the 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 intent of the U.S. Senate was right. Our our right. Senate has gone so far off track from what it was supposed to be, uh, according to the Seventeenth Amendment. But nobody cares because we're too busy about Beyonce's new song. So as long as we stay in this place that's so filled with fluff. And listen, I like Beyonce. I like the Kardashians. I, I don't hate <laughs> on any of these people. A lot of people do. I don't. I watch that stuff. It's great to clean your mind and brainwash yourself when you're consuming massive amounts of media every day. It's yes. a great break yeah. from reality. But uh, at the end of the day. Uh, I realize that's entertainment. It is what it is. And that's there's right. reality and there's entertainment. And I think we have to do that as people. And when somebody tells you, don't talk about politics and religion, I'd say, no, I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about because that's what I do. That's right. That's good. But I think you're you're making a great point. I think it's so very important in this season that people begin to educate themselves and stop being afraid. If you're going to make any sort of political comment or if you're going to say that you don't like our president, President Trump or, or Joe Biden or whoever, it's important then that you educate yourself on policies. Um, I had the opportunity of training some young minds for about five months. And I realized how 
they were so brainwashed with just one side of the aisle. And, it, and I thought, guys, you've got to learn to think. So I started to teach them the difference with media bias, things of that nature, so that they can make decisions on their own. I wasn't even trying to tell them what to think myself, no matter how strong my opinions are. I do see a generation, though, of younger people, 20s, 30s. They, they have a different sentiment towards our political world. They absolutely despise uh, how intense it is between both sides of the aisle, usually with each other. And I see an uprise in these younger uh intelligent men and women who are making some different decisions and they they have a forward uh, you know forward look to to um to our nation and to the po political world they don't even really say that they're democrat or republican most of them say we're we're like in the middle we're libertarian in independent do you see that and what do you do you see some hope for our nation what do you see happening you know <clears throat> i mean do i see hope for the nation i think there's always hope for humanity overall uh, I really do. I'm, I'm a very, very optimistic person that way. Uh, as far as the nation goes, I don't know, uh, honestly, what happens with America because a lot of damage is being done. And the, it's the type of damage, in my opinion, that, you know, if, if you take a jackhammer to the foundation of a house uh, and you create some really big cracks in it, it may not bring the house tumbling down today or tomorrow, but 11, 12, 15, 17 years from now, you might have some massive leaks that could become massive flooding, which can cause mold and bring the whole thing down eventually. It takes time to destroy things. And, and what we're doing right now is we're chipping away at the foundation of yeah. our nation. And, and I don't think that just goes away. You can't put a Band-Aid on it and hope that it's going to grow a scab and heal. I don't think that happens unless we actually make some some actual repairs to this. And, and the, I don't even begin to to say that it's by doing this 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 and this it's truly in changing people right people have to look at things the way i believe that they were intended to be looked at the moment that we buy into this idea like i just mentioned about i'm not involved in politics or i don't i don't care about this or i don't care about that uh, you, you tend to lose people right and they lose their zeal and their gusto for being involved the, our government system the the republic that we have is based on the consent of the governed if the governed don't want to consent because they don't want to engage and they don't want to be involved, it doesn't work. It also doesn't work if we don't do it in a virtuous manner. If people are going to be corrupt and, and do what they do and do what Biden's doing in the White House or what the Democrats have been doing, kind of they've kind of institutionalized doing the wrong thing. Again, it's not going to work. And we're seeing that. And I think that's why we have this crazy border situation that Biden's pretending to fix as yes. of late. <laughs> but people are like, no, you know, the same people that were saying, look, these are new Americans. We got to give them a chance are the same people that are saying, oh, my gosh, did you hear that they raped the lady in the Bronx with a belt around her neck? And, and when people start to see people aren't stupid and they're not blind. Some are some are stupid and some are blind, yeah. but the majority aren't. Yeah. And when people start to see that, they go, you know what? I don't care what you say. This is not good and this is not working. And that's where people are. But for many, it doesn't inspire them to get involved or to vote or to make a change. Uh, oftentimes, it 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 just kind of gets them apathetic where they're saying, I'm totally not getting involved. These right. people are crazy. No matter what we do, <laughs> that's the outcome. Yeah. I'm going to go to work and I'm going to save money and hopefully I don't lose my shirt. Yeah. And I think that's where people are. So that's where in comes Trump with a message of uh, making America great again, of trying to bring about change where people, I think people who don't even like him are saying it's worth a shot. This doesn't look good, right? We seem to be going from, like they say in Spanish, from Guatemala to Guatapayol, and yeah. nobody wants to go from bad to worse. Yes, yeah. Uh, interesting point that you're bringing up, because I thought about the um, immigration issue here with Biden and what he's doing that looks like a... Um, a solution to the immigration problem, but I was reading it and I can't recall everything in detail, but I would love for you to speak into that because I think um, it's an illusion of something that's being done and it's really not an actual solution. What do you say to that? Yeah, well, again, this is very similar to what, when uh, it was announced that we were withdrawing from Afghanistan, right? So if you tell the bad guys, hey, look, I'm thinking of doing this, that, and the other on this date, you got a problem, Houston. Because why? Because they're going to know you're telegraphing your response. So in the same way, Biden says, as of uh, Wednesday, 1201 Wednesday, we are going to be shutting down the border um, and, and we're only going to allow 2,500 people a day. And if we see it go down from 2,500 a day, then when it hits 1,500, we're going to start to allow some asylum um, applications again. But until then, 
we're done. If I tell you every move I'm making, you're going to follow it to a T and it make it look good. And it's, it's nothing but a, a, a PR stunt so that he can say, look, I got to win. I got to win. We slowed down the border for a week and, and then he can try and parade that around. I don't believe it at all because the, the change had nothing to do with him giving words at a microphone. The change had to do with the way that he structurally changed things at the border. He turned the border agents into travel agents, allowing people to come in saying, I'm going to put you on a bus. I'm going to put you on a plane. We're going to put you in the city of our choice uh, for making it look like you have a choice. But we know exactly which city we need to put you in so that we can have the apportionment that we need in Congress by maintaining levels of, of population. And, and that's how they get their money for Congress. So this is a power play for money. And if they can get them to get driver's licenses and magically allow them to become registered to vote, even better for the Democrats, because they're going to remember who let them in and who helped them. I was at a, a restaurant recently. Somebody asked me um, what I did. And I said, oh, I, I do a radio show. Uh, they asked me, what about? And I said, I make fun of Joe Biden for a few hours a night. <laughs> and, and and this person was so young, 30 years old. Uh, she was so offended. And she said, why? Why would you do that? And I said, he's no good for this country, in my opinion. That's right. And she said, but he's done so much. And I said, so much for who? And Correct. she pointed at herself and she said, for immigrants like me. Mm. And I'm thinking, if she can vote, she's voting for Biden. I don't think she can of vote. Course. But when you have 10 or 20 million, as it's being estimated, uh, new voters, that's enough to swing any election, yeah. 10 or 20 million new voters. So wow. I think we have a very big uh, problem on our hands that I don't know that it gets solved quickly. A lot of people are gung-ho to talk about mass deportations. In New York, in, Br in Brooklyn, in Queens, there are these detention centers for uh, asylum seekers. Hmm. When they have conflict with one another, I've seen video after video of six, seven, eight NYPD officers trying to regulate a situation in a room filled with 2,500 people uh -huh. that are unruly. You tell me what army you're going to need to deport just one room of 2,500 people when they get into a fight and 10 cops can't control it. Good luck with mass deportations. Wow. That's so concerning. That's so concerning. You know, it's interesting, though. I have not heard those stories before, but I was going to ask you how uh, people in your area are handling uh, the, influx of, the influx of the immigrants and the benefits. Because, you know, she said, Joe Biden's doing great things for me, an immigrant, but what about Americans who are already here? So that's kind of do. You, uh, so you said you see these videos. I don't usually, I've never seen one. Yeah. Uh, who's reporting that? Well, and, again, a lot of people are inside, right? These are actual law enforcement advocacy groups that are, mm -hmm. you know, kind of complaining. Look at what our cops have to go through because they've taken away after George Floyd. They took away the right uh, of any cop to try to bring somebody to the ground by grabbing them by their neck. Uh, they also, once they have them on the ground, can't put their knee in the middle of their back to try to immobilize them. So just imagine trying to bring somebody down, but you can't grab their neck. You can grab their arm. You can grab their waist. You can do a lot of things, but you can't grab them from the top and bring them down, which is probably the easiest way. And then once they're on the floor, they start squirming, trying to get away from you, put your knee in their back. It's the easiest way to hold them down. You can't do that either, right? You can do a shoulder, you can do behind the leg, but you can't do in the middle of their back, which is the center of gravity, which would really help. So uh, this is, you're talking about hundreds of years of police work doing that stuff. And, and, and now they can't. So they've got their hands tied. And many of them, I think, have given up. They've checked out. I was at the Trump rally in the Bronx. And I remember I heard six gunshots, right? Um, oh. They were pretty... Um, it sounded like a small caliber gun. Every cop there put their hand on their gun, looked around, but they didn't run. They didn't move. They didn't an inch from where they were standing. Why? The reason they didn't is because they, they're they not going to go and put themselves in harm's way and run towards the gunfire mm -hmm. when they know that the mayor doesn't have their back. Most of the people in the city don't have their back. So it, 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 we've created a very un, uh, contentious and untenable situation for cops. And that's completely by design. There are people that want to destroy the constabulary. They do not want police forces. They want what they call violence interrupters. They want social workers. So that if there's a domestic violence, don't bring in a cop that'll stop the lady from stabbing her husband or this husband from stabbing his wife. No. Bring in a social worker that's going to try and help you. 
I've seen this approach and it can work. I've seen clergy that are involved in these things, but that you don't send the clergy in by themselves. You send them in with an armed trained cop right. to make sure that we don't have another casualty when, when this happens and, and it's at the right time. So I, I think we, we, there's a lot of problems. The solutions are many, the laborers are few. There you go. Well, hopefully we get some uh, people who can problem solve in a wise way, because I think there's a, there's been a lot of common sense that has lacked. And uh, so hopefully we'll see something good and better as soon as uh, we get President Trump back in. I, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, what are some last words that you'd like to leave our viewers with, Rich? And then, of course, tell us where they can reach you and stay connected with you and listen into this amazing show. Sure. Thank you for that. Well, um, I mean, I think my, my, the reason I do what I do every day, uh, in addition to loving it, is really because I think that America is a wonderful place. America is a wonderful place. I think families are wonderful. I think that if, if we want to try and, and hold on to what is the cornerstone of society, which is, in my opinion, the family unit and uh, the, 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 the traditions that once made not just this country, but I think a life in general great. I think there, there were times when when husbands were out working and wives were, were raising children, and that may sound outdated or chauvinistic to some, and, and it should be an option. It's no longer an option financially, right? People can't do it because they need multiple incomes to, to, to save for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years before they can own a home. That wasn't always the case. I think we have massive problems with, our, with, um, with the way our currency has, has lost a lot of its buying power. And, and that's, that's one that affects families. We've got policy issues that have gone into like FDR's uh, uh, policies that I think have changed the game and created permanent poverty for so many people, in particular black Americans, followed by Hispanic Americans. And mm -hmm. those are things that I think we need to work on and change because that would allow people a fighting chance. And I think the sentiment is now there, the desire is there. People are saying, you know what? I'd rather have a job than live on the government dole and live in a housing project. But that's not all people. Most people right. in that situation don't know better. They haven't seen better. They've never left the projects. And all they want is a bigger apartment in the projects. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's sad. It's sad that, that we have that type of third world thinking in America. So mm -hmm. I think we have to kind of break down some of these walls. And again, Trump, to his credit, he's done a lot of that. When I was in the Bronx at this rally, uh, I saw black men that, you know, were from the street wearing like license plates around their neck that said Trump. And it was just interesting to see the, the, the level of support. And I was like, that's cool. Can I get a picture? He was like, yeah, Trump all the way. It was really cool because uh, it showed the, the independence of their thinking that once wasn't a thing. And I'm glad to see that. And I think we're going to see more of that as time goes on. If we have a level playing field, if the media behaves the way they're behaving, even just today, right? CNN, I think, is embarrassed right now because they've been made fun of so badly. There isn't a Trump rally out there where he doesn't go, look at all the fake news media out there, right? I mean, <laughs> he constantly beats them and, and good for them. And I think their right. viewership, their sponsors, their ratings, all of that is historically shown true. With MSNBC, same thing. So I think when you look at Fox, right? Fox <clears throat> does really well financially. The New York Post does really well financially. They're both owned by the same company because not because of the, the, the news, but I think because they just, are more honest in their approach and they give people a chance to decide. When you look at New York, um, the New York Daily News, they've been just like the Washington Post, sold for a dollar, sold to a nonprofit. They don't make any money. The Washington mm -hmm. Post makes no money. That's why Bezos came and bailed it out and said, well, I'm just going to have a big vehicle to communicate information, but they don't make any money, right? Mm -hmm. When you have these businesses that exist just for the sake of reaching people and don't make money, you got to ask yourself, why do they exist? What is the purpose behind this? Mm, that's good. It's to get to you. It makes sense for Bezos. He has this need to talk to people. Right. Elon Musk, same thing. He wants to reach people. He bought Twitter, right? Because he's got a lot of big ideas. Neuralink, he wants to put chips in people's brains. He's got uh, electric cars, electric car king. So he, he's all in favor of that. I get it. I understand the motives. And I think everybody needs to understand these motives so that when we look at things, we go, oh, this guy has a, a, a vested interest in reaching me and swaying my opinion. I want to make sure I know what's going on. So that's why I do my show. Now, how do people listen? I'm on 300 and some odd radio stations every night. Uh, we're on live in most markets uh, from New York all the way to Hawaii and Alaska. And that's 10 o'clock Eastern time, New York time till 1 a.m. Some markets carry us on a delay. Uh, we also have a weekend best of show. So the best interviews of the week get repackaged and we play them on Saturdays and Sundays on a number of stations and everybody can go to Rich Valdez and that's Valdez with an S 
rich.com, richvaldez.com. You can get uh, all of the old episodes there, any of the archived episodes. You could stream the show live. You can also um, subscribe to the podcast from any platform. And uh, that's the way to do it. That's wonderful, Rich. You've been such a blessing today. Thank you so much for coming on here and being a powerful voice. I pray that you continue to succeed and just keep rising to the top. I can see you just continuing to do amazing things. So thank you so much for joining the Teresa Lusk show today. Thank you, Teresa. I appreciate it. God bless.